everybody and welcome back to Inky Thoughts Podcast. Now, when you see my guest today, if you think of uh, paper towels, you may be in the right place because, or you might actually have seen his uh, content already on Instagram because it is making some rounds right now, uh, despite how modest he might be about it. And despite the particular peculiar format that is probably most familiar to anyone who frequents a tattoo studio because we have all seen it if you come in in the wee hours of the morning or right before your session the paper towel being pulled out and the sheets being pulled off it readying for the session but what you are actually getting ready for with this guy is probably the coolest teaching moment of your life if you and he even has some of the teacher aesthetic i will say as a guy who has taught myself but he, well, I've been impressed about with him, and the reason I've invited him on, and he'll introduce himself in a bit, is uh, the well-formatted and well-argued points he makes, and how good he is. And we'll get into this in a bit. At t- t- talking b- both sides of an argument sometimes, and also arguing well for his side of a point, and why you should listen to it. Not forcing you, not arguing that you have to listen, but as I would also argue, just giving you the information you need, and then you decide. But before I do go too far, I'll embellish him too much, <laughs> make him go bright red in a bit. Jason, yeah. would you please introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. Uh, my name is Jason. I've been tattooing for 17 years this year. And yeah, alongside tattooing, I make a lot of content for social media. Yeah, I mean, it's as basic as it's as similar as it could be said, right? Yeah, but 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 let's not let's not be too. I just said it. Let's not be too modest about it because <laughs> I I think honestly it's gonna blow up if people, especially if people, start listening to what you're actually saying in some of these arguments. Because I was blown back by how well argued your points were sometimes. And also, really, just to start on a lighter note, like the format, like there's something calming about watching you sit there just be, and you see, as I said, you see it a hundred times before when you when when you get to two. An artist sitting there pulling off the sheets, getting ready to tattoo. And yeah. it's simple, but it's just something calming about that. Yeah, I kind of, one of our clients recently, um, they compared it to having a conversation as in watching the videos that yeah. we're, sat, we're sat together and we're just talking. And I kind of wanted to present that because I feel like a lot of the content that I see from tattoo artists, um, I feel is really overproduced. Mm. in some aspects so we've almost taken tattoo shops and turned them into tv sets yeah which i'm not completely opposed to but i kind of feel like the dark grungy atmosphere that a lot of them create um you know they're copying models that you will see uh people on twitch that stream constantly use and they've kind of thrown a tattoo equipment into the mix of all of that (laughs) So I wanted to make sure that it was very open, very bright, more of a representation of what it's like to actually be tattooed, at least in my studio. Do you know what I mean? So that before before people even come, they know who I am, what my personality is, and the environment that they're in. And thankfully so far it's working because whenever I get a new client now through social media, Instantly, they walk in and they're kind of they're kind of looking around like, oh wow, this this is where this is where all these videos are made. So <laughs> I, I feel like it has a really positive impact, and it break it breaks down the awkwardness of that first meeting where mm-hmm. you know you don't know this person you've met you've met online, but instantly they feel more comfortable. So yeah, that's that's kind of yeah, kind of my my thought process behind. Well, well, it also resonates a lot with, with what I've spoken to other artists about, both from the States and the UK, where a lot of them talk about there's two things that sort of go together here. One is not giving too much into the algorithm, because that mm-hmm. just becomes like a lot of other stuff where things become generic and people just do what seems to just work to get views and that, which is I'm always happy to see when artists instead go for the authentic route. And that sort of leads into the other point which is whenever you are authentic and show off your authentic self, whether you're going to be like, I talked with Paula Castle about whether you're going to be like, oh, this is an old school biker shop. As long as you say that openly and, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. clearly, then you get the clientele in that want that experience and no no one's going to feel tricked or bamboozled or go mm-hmm. in uh, because they didn't know what was going to go on 
and have a harrowing experience. But also people are looking for a studio with a karma, you know, experience can find that because they'll be advertising that. Or people mm -hmm. that are really nerdy like myself can find a nerdy studio where they have all sorts of, you know, pop culture memorabilia on the walls and shit like that. Yeah. So I, I definitely believe in, because I do like this thing that you're also doing of artists showing themselves and their art, giving an impression of who they are, because it helps people vet who would want to be tattooed <laughs> by. Because I think you sort of said it between the lines there as well. It's not just about how good you are tattooing nowadays. It's also that people want an experience they like. Because I think people, even without people like me telling them sociologists, they know that they can regret a tattoo no matter how good it is if they fall out with an artist or if they mm -hmm. turn out to be a piece of shit or really mean to them or whatever, you know. You get the best piece done in the world by somebody like Megan Massacre or somebody, or somebody like that. But if she turned out to be really horrible to you while you got it done, you yeah. wouldn't like it anyways, you know. Of, of course, because then you've, you've attached negative emotions to that thing. Exactly. Yeah, completely. I mean, I, the point that you touched on there, you said that you and Paula spoke about, um, about the being authentic and being yourself. I think that's the most important part. You can only be yourself. And you're hundred percent right. You, you people will get you will get tripped up if you're being something that you're not. Yeah. Um, and yeah, interestingly as well, the trends. The talking about the following trends. Mm. I made a video about this yesterday about this. I wouldn't say a rise because it's been around for a good few years now. But artists that seem to want to make memes mocking clients. Mm. And I don't necessarily mean in the respect of things that we can all relate to because tattoo artists also get tattooed where we're saying, you know, at the end of a long session, when the white goes into the skin, that's the most painful. We can all laugh and joke about that. But there's been a rise that I have seen recently in more people belittling others' ideas. Oh, you know, but, so using the green screens on CapCut with a picture of their booth and they're then, you know posting how I feel when I'm doing your pocket watch tattoo. And the the image that they put over the top is somebody completely discrediting it and they're not happy. From a client's perspective, looking at that then, you've just alienated them. That person's then going to feel awful about the tattoo they've got. They're going to feel awful about their idea. Mm -hmm. And then it breeds a resentment, which has a knock-on effect for the rest of the tattoo industry. Because instantly people have these negative connotations and they then go, right, okay, well, one tattoo artist has seen has said this. So I'm now going to tar every other artist with the same brush. And then it creates more of an issue then for mm. artists that don't behave like that. Yeah, I mean, you're sort of saying, uh, uh, bringing up a very important point there between the lines again, because... We have to remember for most artists, even really good ones with great established clientele, a lot of their clientele will also be what we might call newbies or people that aren't deep within the culture and that who may not get really unique tattoos as such. They, and, and, and ridiculing those ideas just creates a bad image of the of the culture. Because I'll happily sit here as a podcast and say, yeah, I'm tired of white guys with pocket watches as well. But, but, but. There's a long way from saying that, that you don't like that. I think it's overdone to then saying, oh, you're dumb for getting this done. Mm -hmm. you're, you're not. And it might be in one case, it can still be deep meaning because I'm, fuck knows, sometimes you get an idea and you think it's unique and then a thousand <laughs> other cunts have done it as well. That doesn't make the idea any less important to you. It's of the course. intentions behind it. So ridiculing somebody, you don't know their intentions until you talk to them in the studio as a tattoo artist. I mean, it doesn't take being a tattoo artist to know that until you're in that moment, you don't know exactly why they're getting that tattoo done. Yes. Whether you care to know it or not, as long as you don't know that, you, you shouldn't ridicule it because it might be really important to them. Even though it's fashioning in your eyes, it could be really important to them. Oh, yeah, completely. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like... It gets lost a little bit, and it's not just me that feels this way because a lot of the feedback I've had recently in the comments section on some videos that have done well have been a lot of clients um, expressing this as well. And there's a kind of a general consensus going around at the moment that people feel that the ego of some artists mm. has become so great now that it overrides what they want. 
um, and we've taken away. And I think some artists have forgotten that this is still a service industry. Mm -hmm. Like as much as it's art and we are artists and we create, we are offering a service. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't act this way, you know, in, in any other sort of environment. Like I said to uh, one of the people that I work with, you wouldn't get a beauty therapist, somebody who does um, aesthetics, you know, like lip filler, sharing a video of someone who's had a nut allergy reaction and their face has bloomed up to use as kind of saying, this is what you look like after you've uh, you've had some yeah, filler. Is, uh... <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But then here we are in the tattoo industry and we're doing this. And I know that tattoo artists' sense of humour are, are quite dark. As, they can, as a whole. But more often than not, at least, that, that tends to yeah. be the area, right? <laughs> yeah, which I kind of... I kind of think that comes from the same thing as doctors, the same thing as any mm. service personnel. When you are dealing with situations that aren't um, regular and you're seeing people in pain, you're seeing people in discomfort, but you are also the cause of that pain and discomfort, you build walls, you have thicker skin, and you make light of the situation through jokes. Mm. I don't think projecting that for the world to see publicly is the right approach. I do, I do tend to agree that I, do, I, I as much as I love transparency and showing stuff up and you know, all that stuff, there are certain things that may be better kept in studio. Like that, yes. that, that might be better taken case by case with a client. Some yes. may be into it, some may get it, some may not. But you can feel that out when you're with them in person. You can't feel that out when you're just open to the entire fucking social media space. Yeah. And there's a there's a lack of uh, personal self regulation there in a way. Like there's the there's a lack of uh, responsibility to some extent as well. I sort of started thinking of the example of because there's another thing where I think artist ego sometimes goes too far, and I think you might agree with this point as well, where they're starting to complain to talk about ways to almost trick clients into getting exactly the design you planned for them. And the thing is, I've always been a fan of telling people, newbies that come to me, hey, just bring an idea and get their design of that idea. But the thing is, that's not the same as saying I've never said, hey, can we change this? Or would this be cooler when I see the design? Because it's going to be on my body, just yeah. like when you're not a client. And the best tattoo artists I've known in this world, they'll ask before I even ask, hey, anything you want to change? Does this look good, look good for you? Uh, do you like these colors would you like an alternative that's great because it's their design but they're also getting my input and we are building yeah. this together whereas this new idea that's coming up from some of the more prominent artists often actually bigger names than you might want to say this yeah. it's this rock star attitude again that they would have been the ones complaining about with apprentices and younger and younger to two artists in the same breath you know where they're saying, oh, no, I don't want to get the client's input, as little of their input as possible. And it's fine. You do you when it comes to the, oh, do they see the drawing before and all that? That's you. You do that. But when they see the drawing, no matter where in the process it is, it should be allowed for them to be expressive about, does this fit what they want? Yeah. Would you tweak this? Can we do these colors? What about this? Does this work? Because th especially if they're new to it, especially if they're yeah. new. <laughs> Oh, a hundred percent. This is, I, I could not, I could not physically agree more with what you just said. This, unless an artist has a pre-designed design. So if we're talking a, a piece of flash that they've painted, or we're talking a black and gray realism concept that they have put together, yeah. whatever this concept is, if you are packaging it as this is what I want to tattoo and I want to tattoo it like this, for my portfolio, then by all means, you know, you will find a client then that goes, I love that as it is. That's great. But if Absolutely. somebody, if somebody's coming to you and they're saying, I want a lion with a crown and blue eyes and a pocket watch, it's then not on you to change that completely to be what you want it to be, because this isn't about you. And it's a big point that I've raised for years. So I don't have a speciality. I am a tattoo artist. And I stress this constantly because even though behind me in my studio, I have all hand-painted traditional and neo-traditional flash, 
my portfolio is completely varied. The majority of my work is black and gray realism because people come to me and they say, this is what I want. Can you do it? And it's very rare that there's something that I will say, I don't feel comfortable doing this. And that's only normally in the realms of color realism because I don't have, even with 17 years experience, I don't feel that I have enough experience within that to deliver the best that I can I can give them. And I get asked all the time from clients, what's your favorite thing to tattoo? And I feel like it's such a corny and cheesy thing to say, but I guess it comes with age. I've developed now where my favorite thing is making sure they're happy. Yeah. And when I finish that tattoo and they go to the mirror and I see their reaction, and when I speak to them from follow-up messages and they tell me how happy they are, that's everything. Mm-hmm. Because I've been paid, I've been paid for a, a job that I love that then supports my family. But at the same time, I've had such positive interaction with a person that they're now left feeling on top of the world. Yeah, That's far more valuable than impressing other tattoo artists on Instagram. Do you know what I mean? It's it's far more did, valuable than stroking my own that point. And I, w- I will add to it just to clarify for myself as well. I do, I, I personally do love when people have their own unique tattoo style and that. But what I mean yeah. is also that even within their style, of course, it's not all, always all right and preferred if people say, oh, I don't do tribal. Can you go to the, you can go yeah. to this guy. He's amazing at tribal. Having your own personal style is not what I'm talking about. I don't think it's what Jason's arguing against either. It's just that within what you're capable of, it's always good to be flexible to the clients. Yes. In, wishes as well because they are it is as jason has pointed out and as i would always always also always point out among the other monikers tattooing has craft art form it's also service and within that falls that both within craft and service actually falls that you do need to also compromise to the client's wishes and you do want to make sure they're happy with what you're doing as much as you want to develop your art form and develop a certain style and yes of course it can be cool to impress other artists but the main thing is to please to appease and please the clients and give them what they want mm-hmm. you know uh, that sounded almost too subservient but i hope no, that point's no, coming no, across it, it's uh... i kind of feel like a lot of it has been lost so for me starting tattooing the first out straight out of school i left school with no qualifications um i had no interest i couldn't focus at school at all and i didn't pass english didn't pass maths didn't pass science so i left with nothing i mean you're burning him so passing english is you know (laughs) yeah yeah, yeah. no one does it's really rare (laughs) Um, so straight out of school i went into a really working class job in a kitchen and i was pot washing and I was like, right, this is okay. This is okay. So I, the first month of work in there, I worked every single hour they gave me. And I worked as hard as I could. And I was just thinking in my mind, I was like, when I get paid, I'm going to get paid a really good amount. I can do this. I can do that. I can do this. I earned £240 for a month's work. And yeah, so instantly, this big part of my brain went, what the fuck am I doing? Why am I get dedicating all of my time and energy? to doing this for such little money. There's no reward. So then I started looking, what can I do? What can I do? And a lot of my friends were getting tattooed. I was big into listening to metal and punk at the time. So all of the bands were covered in tattoos. And I found this industry where I could be myself. I could look how I wanted to. I could be paid quite generously for what I did. And all I had to do was do what people asked. So it's, for me, I feel like a lot of it has been lost. And I get the ego. I get when you've got tens of thousands of people constantly praising you mm-hmm. and they're talking about you. You know, if you're at, uh, if you do convention circuits and you're regularly win- winning awards, um, it's then very easy to kind of look at the, look at yourself and go, well, I can do what I want because I've reached this point now. But as I have seen in the 17 years I've been tattooing, the higher you go, the harder you fall. And I've seen it happen with a few tattoo artists already that we went from looking at them as an industry going, oh my oh my God, this person is leading in their field to now they're posting on Facebook that they have availability tomorrow. So 
it's not permanent. It's not forever. And I feel like everybody needs a reality check to be like the most important part about our career and our industry are the people who get tattooed. Yeah. It's, it's that simple. You know, no, it's not, it, it's it sort not of right. goes back to the thing that a lot of, uh, both, uh, luckily I've seen more young people as well gravitating toward this idea. I think that's still, mm -hmm. I think it's almost a half and half split now with young tattooers. And I think that's a positive change coming. A lot of positive change comes from the younger generation, but that's a whole other conversation right yeah. now. But, but at least with this, like that, that people are, stop, are starting to not focus too much on following on social media and instead trying to develop this discerning eye that we tried to develop through, you know, tattoo magazines and that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and reading up and talking about it and seeing it in studios and that. Where, where when you develop a discerning eye, you instead of saying, "Oh, this person has fifty thousand followers," you can look at it and be like, "Oh, but that line work and that that stuff. This guy with five thousand, he's got way more solid, you know." Because yeah, I, it's, it, I've been tattooed by a, fair, by a few people by now, and some of them have had great followings, others have had not so great followings in social media. It's mad at all, fuck all to me, because I've looked at their work, and if they do solid work, that's what I want, you know. And at the same time, uh. Going back to the to sort of explaining with my own personal example what you're talking about, when I went to it's that's why you can shop a route today with the two artists because the thing is, yeah. go I went to for example a little Kaya of Scotland and and I said to her, hey, I love your style, can you do me a vampire lady? And she said, cool. Any any like specific things I should know other than it being a vampire yeah, yeah. lady? And I said, well, I love the stuff you do. What's like the face and maybe a little bit of the neck and that. Uh, can you do and, and I really like brunettes and, and if that's all you give them that's cool that's the freedom but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but but I'm the odd one out there sometimes and that's fine if you have more wishes than that that should also be allowed that's sort of my point if if, if I've gone to, if in this hypothetical example now if I'd gone to Kaya and said oh yeah but can she also has this, have this jewelry or this uh, lipstick on can she have the, the no blood can she do this like that should be allowed as well like, of course it's 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 sort of this thing that just because you have a personal style, you should still listen to the wishes of the client to uh, some extent, you know. A hundred percent. I th I think that the only exception to that is still massively within yeah. the interest of the person who's getting the tattoo. Yeah. So yeah, I yeah. feel that the only time that it's really acceptable to kind of turn around and go, no, is when too oh, much yeah. is being asked or it, the design can't balance properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, absolutely. If, and then you know i had a guy um last year he wanted to get a sleeve started with me and um all of the ideas that he gave me i could have made two sleeves out of oh, and yeah. He wanted, yeah and he wanted to compress it to a forearm wraparound Whoa. in black and gray realism so i just changed my approach and i just said to him right let's make a list of priority mm -hmm which of these is most important to you and then which ones can i pair together yeah. so i said okay so for me to make this look for you, as good as it can for you i will i want to pair this and this on this side this and this on this side and then we've got a spin gap down the back so we'll put this here and once i'd explained that to him he was like yeah perfect Be because he got it but i think the approach is important and yeah, it's what the, the place that it's coming from. If it's coming from, as we were saying, uh, an egotistical point of view, where somebody is saying, I'm not doing this, this is what I want to do, then that's not the correct approach. But if you're coming from a place of genuine, I am here to tell you mm. how what, what's going to work best. I'm here to give you the oh, best. Yeah, absolutely. Because tattoo artists will have that you know, experience and knowledge to know what yeah. works in the body and what can work in the design. They also know their own skill and capability. And I mm -hmm. am absolutely, as much as I'm for listening and compromise with the client's wishes, I am just as staunch, as staunch a supporter of reality checking clients as well if they have yeah. unrealistic wishes. It's it's this back and forth that I miss sometimes, uh, you know? And I've been yeah. very fortunate and very lucky. I've only been tattooed by people where if on our rare occasions have that, or if I have an unrealistic wish sometimes, you know, I've developed some idea of what can, can yeah. be done myself, you know, by now. 
but but I uh, usually go with artists that will tell me then, oh, I don't think I can make that work, and can we do this and that? And that's great because I have that is that, and I've been very fortunate to have artists like uh, that work the same way you do. You know where there's yeah. a conversation, you talk about it, there's exp it gets explained, and then you can sort of figure out what works. And yes. I've never been unfortunate enough like others I know to have artists that just go like, no, no, because I don't want to do that because that's a dumb design idea. That's just like. Don't do that. Don't don't call it dumb. It might be important yeah. to them, and they're wishing for this because they think it's cool in some way in their in their mind. Just oh, it's just unnecessary what? to do that. It's quite interesting, actually. I thought about this the other day. I, I thought about this when I made the recent video that I said where I spoke about memes, and I thought to somebody who's not uh, a collector or within the industry. They're going to look at most tattoo artist tattoos and think that they've got the dumbest shit tattooed on them. Because, <laughs> and then, like, this works both ways. Why aren't clients uh, making memes saying, what the fuck have you got a panther head coming out of a rose? No. You know, well, why have you got that? That makes absolutely no sense. You've got this rose and this tiny little panther head, but two people within tattoo and you're like, that's awesome. Yeah, you know, so it kind of it works both ways, and that reality check needs to come back into oh, it. Absolutely, <laughs> like I have got a good example. Of that. I have a samurai polar bear on my ribs, and to incredible. tattoo lovers, incredible. that's incredible. Yeah, to non-tattoo lovers, that's the some of the weirdest shit they've ever seen. Uh -huh. Yeah, and then they're gonna turn around and go, "Well, well why have you got that? Why didn't you just have a polar bear?" Or yeah, exactly. you know what I mean? like, what? So yeah, it, it works both ways, and I kind of feel like that that reality check needs to be given. But, but then again, with social media, we are in the Wild West still. There, there are yeah. no set clear rules. Um, a lot of people, it hasn't really sunk in that everything you upload is forever. It, it doesn't go anywhere. Once it's released, it's not yours anymore. And there's not a single thing you can do to remove it. So I kind of feel like people haven't truly grasped that concept yet. They haven't truly got it. That they may make a meme today that they find funny, but four years down the line, that meme could be a big reason as to why now they're not booking as much as they were before. Mm. So it's it's a very interesting time online with the tattoo industry. And as things evolve so quickly, watching so many artists refuse mm. to move along with it, yeah. which is a whole other issue. I will, I will say I'm a bit more hopeful and positive. It might be because I'm not working in the industry myself, but I'm a bit yeah. more hopeful and positive looking at it from the outside in as a sociologist. I do think I see a lot of positive change, especially from the younger people coming in sometimes, where they do try to move along and be more conscious and more mindful of clients and all that. Like you mm -hmm. see even how they try to have snacks and blankets and all that, that stuff. And some old heads are like, oh, that's going too far. And it's like, oh, it's not going too far. If they want to do that for the client, that's up yeah. to them. But it, it, the positive change that it symbolizes is awesome to me that it is more people that are like, hey, you're here, you're going to be in pain. I'm not going to be in pain. I'm going to be doing something I love on your skin for money. Yes. Let's make you comfortable here. <laughs> like, yeah, completely. You know? Completely, yeah. Things things have changed massively. And I think... I mean, we are, to... we are luckily at least, I will give this to the industry at least, we are far oh, removed from the second. age of the... Oops. I'm really sorry. I am so sorry the postman would not stop banging my door so my dog is it, ha it happens, no worries. <laughs> but I thought I could ignore it the first three times <laughs> nuts and I, I can't ignore it. I couldn't I even know. hear it. Right, that should be fine now. We stop laughing. Come on. Do you want to say hello? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've got oh, a push on. Oh. A tiny little tiny little poodle. He's fully grown and he's about oh, that big. Oh, right. All right. So whenever he hears the door bark, uh, door knock now, that that's it. He's a oh, uh, he's he's a rock rider. <laughs> Sets him off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh well, yeah. to what I was saying, um, I think we are at least far removed from the days of the asshole tattoo artist that go where you go and pick off the wall and go like, "What do you want, asshole? Come on!" Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. At least we're far removed from that. Yes. So, so, you know, we have taken a step in a positive direction in general in the two world, but there are still some people hold, clinging on to some of that old school shit. I have to agree with you. Like, yes. there's, there's still some well, people in... are like, oh, if somebody comes up with a stupid idea, I just tell them to their face. And it's just, and then they almost expect applause from like other artists in the room. It's just, no, that's not all right. It's, the, it's yeah. the, like shit, it's... man. 
you're not Inter- builders on the fucking site, man. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, completely. Interestingly, you said earlier that a lot of this comes from some of the biggest names, and I, I kind of noticed this myself. A lot of the memes that are being created are being pushed by really well, well, really well respected accounts. It's it's quite interesting um, as to why they're doing that. You know, you'd think that somebody who already has the platform. I mean, as a sociologist, my guess would be that it's the same thing we see with celebrities at some point because they, they are the same thing for celebrities and, and two artists. Yeah, you're all eccentrics. In one way or another. Yeah, yeah. But for some eccentrics, when you get a lot of following, a lot of backing, so to speak, a lot of people that sort of validate your voice, suddenly you get more honest in a way. <laughs> and I put quotation yeah. marks around that because I'm not really sure if that's the best word for it. But for a lack of a better term, you sort of get more brazen, perhaps there's a better uh, yes. word to use. And you start feeling like you can't lose. You start feeling like you, you, there's no wrong you can do. So some opinions you may otherwise have been forced to reflect more on because you're not sure if that's going to be all right or if that's correct, you just fire them off. Yes. And I think that's what happens sometimes. And I think that's why we see it. Not all big names. There's also beautiful examples of amazing people that are massive in the two industry. But we do see some big big names so it's sort of slip to two artists who are absolute cunts to put it to put it in no small terms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And who talk about clientele as if they are uh should should ha- should uh, feel uh, fortunate and uh and lucky and thank their stars yeah. that they got a space with them as if they don't pay money to do so and probably yeah. pay extortionate <laughs> rates to do so in yeah. some cases. Where they should rather be grateful because fair enough. It's an unregulated industry. You can set your prices as you want. And if you feel it's worth mm-hmm. it, set it the way you want to. But you should still be grateful that people want to pay that money because that's not 100%. automatic. <laughs> 100%. Yeah, it's a really interesting point that you said that. I I think the I mean, another big thing that, that people have been saying as in clients that I've been reading a lot, again, especially in the comment sections of the videos I'm making, and, and people saying the lack of price transparency is a huge, huge turnoff for them. And I completely get it. If you, it's almost that whole thing. If you walk by a shop front and you see things in the window that catches your eye, if there is no price, the likelihood is it's too expensive for you. And it kind of feels the same way that if there's no price transparency on what people are charging, Right. then how can somebody possibly know whether they could afford it? They don't want the embarrassment of uh, inquiring only to be told it's this much. And yeah. then they've but that's also got because we're down. seeing this research as you talked about with people getting quite yeah. abrasive with them sometimes if they inquire yeah. about price in the two world. And again, I don't say all to two artists to do that. I, for example, been very fortunate. I have never yeah. had artists that have been abrasive with me about pricing or anything like that Incredible. or asking Good. about it. But they are out there and you see the stories, yeah. you know people with the stories, you encounter people with the stories of them asking, oh, what is this? And then they say, oh, I can't afford that. That's a yeah. jerk reaction. That's that's a, not jerk as in they're being a jerk, but like, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's not a reaction where they're like thinking, oh, I got to tell this artist off how there they have that price range. No, it's a knee jerk reaction. It's, it's just, yeah. if you told like, oh shit, if I was told by Jason right now that, oh, I charge 1200 quid uh, for half a day, I'll be like, oh shit, I can't afford that. That's mm-hmm. not telling Jason he can't charge that. It's just yes. me being fucking blown away by Jason taking Yeah, 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 no, completely. But just to be clear, Jason doesn't, I don't think Jason takes no, 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 1200 I, don't. I, don't, I, <laughs> I, I, I do not charge anywhere near that much. Um, I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, just strictly hypothetical example. The idea of you saying that, I've already started spending it in my head. <laughs> if I if I was well, getting that much, yeah. what am I spending it on? But you get, but you get my point, right? Like, I yeah. don't think people react that way because they want to tell artists stuff. I mean, of course, there will be idiots out there that will do that or will try to uh, heckle the price and stuff like that, mm-hmm. and those can be very annoying. I get yeah. that. But for most people, if they react with, ooh, I can't afford that, it's not them, it's just a knee-jerk reaction, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, like, I could easily imagine myself saying that, even though I'm a staunch defender of, like, hey, I'm not going to handle prices on tattoos. 
You tell yeah, me yeah. what I have to pay, and if I can afford it, cool, let's go. 100%. But, 100%. but I would still react that way. If, if, if like, Let's say I finally got to get a, a session with Beth Rose someday this year, next year. If Beth then turned around and said to me some price I couldn't afford, I'd, I'd react like that. I wouldn't tell her to put down her price, but I would be like, yeah. got it that I can't afford it anyways, you know. And that's sort of how you react then. It's, it's it's better than going and saying, oh, I'm so sad I can't get this too because why would you tell that to an artist you're not going to be working with, you know? That yeah. seems like you're going to heckle. So you just react with, oh, I can't afford that. <laughs> yeah, and I think, yeah, and I just think that at the moment that's a big thing that some people are struggling with, which I understand completely is the... Absolutely. They're not wanting to say that they can't afford it. Um, yeah, so... I don't think that will ever change. No, I don't, no, I don't because the tattoo industry is an unregulated industry. That that will not change. There's no governing body that says that we have to outline this. And you know, we're all self-employed. We all set the own our own rules, our own parameters around working. Um, yeah, so I don't think that's going to change. All all no. we may see is some tattoo artists like myself. I'm very transparent about my entire pricing structure. No. Um, be more transparent. We might see more people go, okay, so people are saying this, so I'm just going to put it out there. And then people can respond to that however they want. Yeah. I love In when people do that. I, lo I love when I see artists that, are, even if it's not, you know, set prices they have for certain amounts of hours, uh, even when they just do like, hey, this project, uh, if you want to get that done, it's this price. I yes. love that. Because they're being yeah. open about it and they're saying, hey, I have this one I do this cool design I really would like to do in somebody I'm thinking this price for this size this price we want to get at this size any mm -hmm. takers that's cool that's fucking awesome yeah 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 completely but it's when you go out and say hey I want to do this design let's talk price together then you're inviting a discussion and some people that do that don't actually want to discuss the price with the client they just want to hear how much they want to pay if they can't pay what they were thinking in their head next client that, yeah. And that that seems a bit of a jerk move, and in this time I do mean jerk in in the. Yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you get what I mean, like like yeah. the transparency seems really cool and creates an avenue for open communication as with any thing you sell. Yeah. Whereas when you say, "Oh, uh, here's a design for a sleeve," uh, come contact me for to discuss pricing. That that that's nuts to me, because mm -hmm. I doubt most that do that will actually want to haggle price with the person that messages them. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. I will be so surprised, and if they are out there, who knows to you? But I sincerely doubt that ninety percent of artists that do that that do that method actually want to haggle price with whoever contacts them. Oh no, they they want. I, they are I, looking I, for silent. I believe they want in the, the price in the, they in want. the DMs, yeah. basically. They're yeah. looking for a secret auction in the DMs where people are going to try and outbid each other, <laughs> and when they see somebody that pays something that's really cool and they can afford, and that really you know fits with their idea, they thought it was going to cost. That's going to be the guy they take. Yes. Yeah. Whereas with the other thing, you can be very open, and then okay, people also quickly get the idea that okay, Jason put out this design. It's a uh, three hundred quid, uh, for and then you immediately also get the idea that oh, it's first come first serve. So I'll put my ticket in. I'll say, hey, I would like to pay that. If nobody's put in uh, every every a, a wish for it yet, can I get that tattoo? You yeah. Know? Oh yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, it, absolutely, completely. I think a big thing, a big divide with the tattoo industry at the moment, though, is where people's perceptions on what tattooing should be and what tattooing yeah. is. Because I'm seeing, and I have seen it for the last 10 years, so it's not a new thing, I would say, within the last decade. But people trying to deliver more of a higher-end um, service with tattooing where it's more exclusive. It's yeah. not what we're used to. And I completely respect it, but I think Absolutely. at the opposite end of the spectrum, there's still a lot of people who, like myself, are trying to deliver more and keep it more accessible for everybody. Mm. And for me, I feel at the moment the industry is split into two and you've got this one end where it's being treated as if it's a Lamborghini 
and this end it's public transportation. Do you know what I mean? Like the two stark and the, the, and the, the funniest thing for me looking as a sociologist at this is that they have one common denominator, which is that in the Western world at least it's self-expression, no matter which way you do it. Hmm. And one person is trying to make it a very luxurious thing, whereas the other side very much understands that we all want to express ourselves yes. through the body and that. And I think they, they have more in common than they think, but they are, from where I see it, they're sort of creating these two separate camps where they could be working together and stuff. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, and I, I understand it. I do understand that there are some artists out there. I remember hearing of an artist years ago, um, and... Back then, I think in like 2012, his uh, day rate was £700, which back then it, it was, I had not really heard of many artists charging £700. Uh, but uh, this person told me that you essentially get two days for that because what they would do is the day prior to your appointment, they would spend the entire day, the working hours, designing your design. Uh, and then the following day, they would tattoo you. So the whole point of charging the 700 was so that they could dedicate two full days to you. And when that was explained to me, I kind of thought, well, I get that. You know, in, in that instance, you are truly paying for this yes. service. No, no, getting from, not many people are offering. I don't really know many people that split their working week to have one day design, one day tattoo, one day design, one day tattoo. Mm -hmm. And I think a big issue at the moment um, from a client's perspective with the pricing of some artists is because where there are people that are putting that level of effort and dedication into it, you've got the same people who are throwing together a design from Pinterest in the morning of their appointment. They're turning up. The artist isn't prepared. They're not ready to go. They're, you know, they're sat there for two hours waiting to be tattooed and they're still being charged £700 for the privilege. Mm. And I kind of feel like that, that's another side to the the um, luxurious offerings in oh, tattooing. That, that some people are looking at it now and going, I want that, but I don't want to have to put that same level of effort in as these guys. So I'm going to present that this is what I'm mm -hmm. giving and I'm going to give, um, yeah, much, give a lot less attention to this yeah. client than maybe the other people are. We well, sadly see that in many professions. Like, yes. like, yeah. like look at look at look at for example carpentry or plumbing or anything like that some guy might do some luxury stuff like putting in an incredible sink for, for a client that looks amazing and then another guy's like oh he earns a lot of money doing that and doing like plumbing for like the middle class cool i'll do the same thing but i'll like cut corners and that so i can earn even more you yeah. see that in any profession sadly and that, just as you said but the, the other point i don't think we'll get rid of that but it's only good that people yeah. are aware because because the only re way you can save some clients from going in and getting sort of tricked like that is by other artists being aware and like helping them learn the skills to know, okay, what well, I'm actually getting here. And that happens yeah. with the transparency you're talking about. If more artists are transparent about what you get with what you pay for, mm -hmm. then you people also get a much clearer image of what they can expect from different four kinds of tattoo artists and what they should be getting, perhaps. Not that you can have a completely objective idea of that in, a, yeah. in an art form, but at least they can have more of a clear idea of what they should be able to expect from paying X amount of money for a tattoo session. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, and I kind of feel like this leans into a use of social media really well. Um, I'm not going to claim that this is an original thought because I have heard this said by other people. But a big thing that I keep saying, because since hearing it, I can't get it out of my head, is that the entry requirements now in tattooing are to be good at tattooing. Yeah. That's, that's the ticket to play. That's the price to get your entry ticket. Once you've entered, now what are you offering? What is the mm -hmm. next part that you are now offering to people out of the tens of thousands of options you know, it's not uncommon for people to fly now. I've got clients that fly from Germany. I had a client oh. last week fly from Ireland, um, all through social media. So it's not it's not uncommon now with affordability with travel. So what are you offering? What is separating you from your peers and why should they come to you? And I feel like that's that's a great point with transparency where it can be a real tool for artists to say exactly as you've just said, 
this is the price and this is what you get for that price and and this is what i will do for you yeah. um for your money and you put that out there and i believe in return you you you'll be very fruitful to do that you will get a lot I, from I, it. I think so it's, it's it's the same thing like we talked about earlier and i talked with a lot of guests in this podcast about when you put your authentic self out there no matter how many followers and clients and fans you get you will get some diehard people that do come to you exactly for that thing. Yeah. And that, it's the same thing as transparency here. If people like what you put into the service for the money they're putting out there, whether it's extra attention to their physical needs, something like that, whether they're or it's uh, snacks or it's whatever, you know, or extra attention to the side or involving them in the process or whatever it can be, they'll come to you for exactly that. Yes. Even if it's that you do it old school, or if you do it extremely new school, or if you do it whatever it is you do about this whole tattoo experience, as long as you're transparent with it, people will seek you out for that experience. Because other people are doing the same style of tattooing as you. And even though you have unique st- takes on those styles, mm-hmm. for a client, they may still think, well, this guy actually has an experience I resonate more with. So they both have a cool style, but I'll go with him. Yes. Because I like what he's doing more with the experience. That's exactly what they do, especially people that want longer sessions because you're going to be there for four to eight hours, you know. So you, yeah. you do want to... Uh, uh, honestly, that's why I started resonating to going and getting tattooed with people that are at least somewhat nerdy. Because yeah. we have shit yeah. to talk about or they might have a yeah. telly and we can watch anime or fucking weird yeah. nerdy movies or something like that, you know. And that's becoming quite important for me with these sessions, with, with getting to you know. <clears throat> Whereas when when I started out getting my first tattoo in 2008, and Denmark's a bit more behind the times than the UK and the US, there was nothing like that. So you just went in yeah. to the word of mouth shot you heard about, and it was like, oh, here's my design. And they'd be like, all right, into a stencil yeah. machine, not even changing anything, yeah. slap it on, your, on my chest, out the door. Yeah, you literally, know, literally. I'm fucking happy that it's not like that anymore. And I was very fortunate. From my second to two on, I'd already found a nerdy to two artist from my brother. And it was yeah. always going to be a nerdy hangout from that day on when I got to two. You know? Oh, completely. Completely. Like, it's so funny that you say that. Um, my first experience getting tattooed, uh, I was underage, um, I will admit. And I sat there, it was on my ribs, it was an outline of a swallow that I've still never had coloured in. And uh, <laughs> the, the other artist, the other artist uh, turned to the guys tattooing me and said, are we ready to see a grown man cry? And I was laying there thinking, I'm a boy. <laughs> I am a boy. And the the complete and utter turnaround to that now is when our clients come in. So I'm a big Pokemon fan. And when I find out if somebody's into Pokemon or played the games, there's a particular YouTube video that I always put on the TV in the studio. And it's about these two guys, a similar age to me, like mid thirties. And they're trying to resurrect a Blastoise that got corrupted. And like, we will put that on in the shop and we all kind of sit there and <laughs> you can see on everyone's faces because it's a shared interest. And yeah, it, it, the room fills with joy, but it's such a stark difference to when I first got tattooed, as you've just said, uh, yeah, to these bikers in, in that kind of environment, to now a bunch of guys in their mid thirties uh, getting very excited about Pokemon. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, like it's similar it's to that when I got different. my Star Wars sleeve done. All we did was listen to yeah. metal covers of Star Wars soundtracks. Like... <laughs> <laughs> Incredible! Incredible! Exactly. Like, but that's the thing. No matter what it is, when you when when you when you do get, uh, and I think this moves beyond because a lot of mainstream people that just get a few tattoos, they they they, they just seek comfortable, what to be comfortable, what to be respected, what to be taken care of in a nice way. Mm-hmm. But for the nerds, for the people that are either nerdy with tattoos or go even further into other nerd dumps, when they want to get tattooed, they look for an experience that resonates with the stuff they want to get done. Yes. And I think that's important. Like, like, not necessarily that needs to fit perfectly. Like, when I got my vampire yeah. lady done, we watched anime on the telly, but it's still, you know, fun to sit there with another person that yeah. we can at least have that in common, too. And she thought it was a cool idea. All that stuff, it all adds up to that's a lovely experience. I remember that just as much as I liked it, too, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah, completely. And I think it's a really interesting thing. 
I feel that most people, you will remember exactly where you were the day you got every tattoo yeah. you got, <laughs> where you were, what you were doing, and you will remember the craziest details about that day. Because it's, <laughs> you're marking your body. It's such an important thing. And I feel that the more tattoos we get, the less we understand that. It gets lost a little bit. Maybe that comes back into why some artists act the way that they do online. Maybe we're forgetting you know, what it felt like to be so young within the industry. I mean, you will become jaded if you spend a long time in any profession sometimes. Yeah. And, and even just yeah. spending a handful of years in the tattooing industry can, for some, be enough to do that, you know? Oh, 100%. Especially given some of the studio environments that people are subject oh, yes, to. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. You know, it's it's hard. It, I, I think, feel like this is one thing that we don't really talk about a lot is how hard the industry can be sometimes. Um, I feel like with the video that I made where I spoke about it being quiet at the moment. So yeah. a big frustration for me was at the time of making that, I've still got work in my diary. Um, and I've got this saying that I always say, I can't do tomorrow's tattoo today. So as long as I'm booked at least three, four weeks, I can rest easy, I can think. And, yeah. you know, I, the reason I made that video was because a lot of the artists that I was talking to, I was seeing artists close shops. I was seeing artists post on Facebook that they were looking for other jobs. You know, it wasn't an isolated thing. I started to see it grow yeah. more and more and more. Um, and, yeah, I've lost my train of thought a little bit. How did I, what did I start saying with that? You started to talk about how, you know, you keep business going, how you do the changing environments that in the studios. Yeah. And with the, <clears throat> with how some place, so there's very quiet right now because the, I think maybe because of the economic situation, then people are complaining they're not, not getting enough clients. Yeah. Sorry. I've had a complete and a brain wipe. I can't, remember, <laughs> I can't remember the point that it happens. It was a very, very important part then. And I built myself up, and I can't remember exactly where. But I, I do was. remember talking about your somewhat your video because I've watched a few of them. I'm not the best of them, all. but you were talking about in that video as well that people complain a bit too much about how quiet it is sometimes, and wanting to change prices and either our jobs and all that stuff, instead of trying to be more open to clientele than that, and be, and be more open to perhaps being less of a, <laughs> to put it bluntly, because. You have to be political. I may not uh, be less of a dick to clients, to be honest. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah, people yeah, yeah. Might no, come in, you know. And I think that's what resonates with that video, what we're talking about right now, that that if you figure out, for example, a niche experience you can provide clients with, that they mm -hmm. resonate with, it, you, no matter how quiet it seems generally in the two world right now in industry, you may still get enough clientele to support yourself because they'll come for that experience. Yes, Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, completely. Um, you can. I, I say this all the time. Yeah, so I say this all the time to my friends and people that I talk to that have been struggling. Because one thing that I've I'm really appreciative of, and really really shocked because I feel that my position in making content, I'm at the very bottom. That's yeah, yeah. how I feel about it. I, I'm under no illusions. Um, I had half a million views the last 28 days, and I still feel like that is that is there. You know, there's some people creating videos and they're doing incredible jobs. But one of the things that I was blown away by recently is I've I've had, I think, maybe three or four artists now that I don't know come forward to now ask me advice um, on different things, whether it's what can they do to, to get more work? what How can they make content that will work for them? Um, and I'm blown away by it. You know, these people message me and I genuinely am taking time out of my day to reply to them and make sure that, I'm giving them as much information as I can because, you know, this is what the tattoo community is supposed to be about. Yeah. We we are supposed like to be helping each nowadays. other. Yeah. yeah, like we're not, it's not competition. My studio is a private studio and everybody's self-employed and I am very much down the line. I do a very affordable set chair rental. I charge my guys and girls one seven five a week and I provide everything except for gloves, needles and ink. So they can literally come to work. They need to provide those things and that's it. You know, they yeah. can do their job and they're all self-employed. And I always say there, there's no competition in the shop because the shop isn't providing work for anyone. They provide it for themselves. Yeah. And because of that environment now, you push each other because you're not looking at your peers and going, you could take food out of my mouth. 
the next tattoo that comes through the door should be mine, but you might take it. So I need to get up first. Like I remember the days of having to, you know, you're sat there quiet. There's three artists not doing anything in the shop and someone comes through the door and you're like, I've got to get up first. I've got to be the first person to greet them. You know, so I'm very much all for pushing a positive environment and, yeah. and pushing this whole, um, you know, we will go further and do more as a collective than we ever will standing on our own. I do like that that does seem to be the, the the general consensus nowadays in the modern tattoo world. Because when you hear about what it was like, I mean, I was too young. I was born in 1990. But when you hear about yeah. what it was like in the 90s and the 80s, where it was like, oh, a shop opened up down the road. Well, we're going to go fucking destroy it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because there's still some people with that mentality around, of course. But the thing is, I do like this mentality of working more together. Because that's also, when you look at any marginalized group or industry or cult subculture that's how it guards itself against all the other pressures of society that's how it it becomes stronger and survives through these stigmas and prejudices and all that stuff by the people within it working together and supporting each other and that starts with the two artists because as much as collectors uh like myself are part of building the two culture as well of course we are but it starts with the two artists It yeah, starts with the people that provide this this service and and this medium of self expression. You know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because even in terms of competition, it, it can become really healthy. Like yeah. with the people that I work with, sometimes I will look at what they're tattooing, and I will genuinely afterwards I'm a little bit pissed off, but at myself because I'm more like I should have been thinking about that. Uh, why yeah. why didn't I come up with that idea? So then I'll go home and I'll be like, you know, instead of watching mm. TV tonight, I'm going to draw. I'm going to get my yeah. design done. And then instead of just staring aimlessly at TV, I'm going to draw and I'm going to try and come up with a concept that's that's better than what my colleague did today. And then yeah. I come back to work the next day and I'm like, look, look at what I've done. And then I can see from their face and that they're like, well, why didn't I think of that? And you, rather than creating this horrible atmosphere of, You're trying to, you know, yeah. the days are gone of trying to screw each other over to get work. Hi. We, I, I've worked in loads of shops where that's been the case. Yeah. You know, you're tattooing a client and they're talking to you about their next idea and somebody comes over and goes, I'd love to tattoo that. And you, you're <laughs> tattooing your client thinking, fuck off. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, fuck off, go away. Um, instead of that being the kind of atmosphere, you're now sitting there and you're going, cool okay so you're pushing me and i'm pushing you and ultimately we're going to get better we're all going to get well, better from it. that actually alludes to another thing i really love that's happened today and i think you've talked about this in some of your videos too and talked about how we the industry should be proud of this nowadays and and do this more actually because mm -hmm. it will help with the quietness as well is that they shouldn't be afraid of this thing that developed through the new 2000s of hey i'm not good at that just post this so i'll send you over to them That's mm -hmm. a great thing. That's a really healthy thing yeah. in, in an industry like this to be able to say, hey, hey, because the other guy will do the same then in the other direction. They'll be like, oh, fuck, I don't do Pokemon. What the fuck is a pocket monster? Yeah, 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 Go yeah. to Jason, you know? <laughs> so I kind of feel like that this is this is a double-edged sword. So yeah. a lot of people online, younger, younger people are saying that tattoo artists gatekeep the industry, right? Yeah. And I am very split on my personal feelings of that yeah, because yeah, on yeah. one side, I'm like, this should be free for everybody to access. And, but on the other side, a part of my brain keeps telling me there is a reason why things are guarded in the way that they are and why they have been guarded for so long. And I kind of feel like this leans into it. So back in the day, you would get artists recommend other artists in your city and someone comes in and goes, I want to get this. Um, and then they go, I can't do that for you, but my friend on the other side of the city can. You know, they've done something incredible and very similar, and they can do that for you. And then that seemed to be something um, that existed more then than it does yeah. now. Whereas now I feel that because so many artists are coming through different channels and different means, and we've got artists who, thanks to modern advancements with technology, are two years into a career, and they're incredible. At two years, they're at the point that I was at in 10 years in. You know, it took me a decade to get my loan work down, to get my black that saturated, to do this, to do that. And they're already there two years in. But what they've skipped is all of the parts that we that made the community what it was. 
They've mm. skipped the, the you don't tread on other people's toes. You don't do this. You don't do that. And as much as a lot of those rules can be problematic, yeah. I feel with them diminishing, so has respect in a lot of ways. And respect should be earned and not given, but at the same time of kind of going, people don't think twice now. They see a tattoo shop on the street and they go, I'm going to open one next door. And that's that's now completely disappeared. Whereas yeah. before you'd go, do you know, I'm going to go five miles away from the shop. Five miles is enough. There's enough people between us that this isn't going to impact your livelihood. You know, it's... I mean, I do get it uh, to some extent. I mean, I've, I'm, yeah. of course, not a tattoo on myself. But, but I do think sometimes, and I think this is where the difference is, because I remember a good example I saw once where two shops on the same street, like just diagonal, mm. but they were mates and they'd like spoken to, and I did ask them once, like, well, how come you're not angry at them having opened that shop over there? And, that, and the guy just simply was like, well, because they talked with us before they did that. We had a communication yeah. and and we we figured out that yeah that's fine like they they do something completely different than us so we'll we'll it's not not a problem because that yeah. that's the thing when people are like oh they open a successful anime tattoo studio right there i'm going to open my anime tattoo studio next to theirs and get the clientele yeah. that's thinking way too much in that business mindset that other people do with like fucking uh, convenience stores and shit like that <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> where where you think it's uh, because they don't take it as personal the problem is this is a tattoo by tattoo paycheck. So mm -hmm. when you do that without respecting the other people or, or, or thinking about the shared market in that way, I think that's the right way to put it. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> uh, you, you are actually diminishing somebody's business there, whether it's your own because you can't keep up or whether it's theirs because you've now become the new attractive thing on the block. So I think the communication side of it is what's lacking sometimes. Yes. And that's what yeah. I see sometimes. Because I think there's a lot of stuff, the older duration especially, I might be biased there, could learn from the younger ones. But there's the stuff about communication and respect that the younger ones need to learn from the older one. And what's yeah, lacking yeah. here is the communication between the generations sometimes. Yes. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's so interesting you said that about the shops. So where my studio is, um, there are probably... <laughs> There's got to be about 10 shops within a mile and a half radius because I'm right okay. in Birmingham. <laughs> like, I'm literally 10 minutes out. There are a lot of where... studios in Birmingham from what I hear. Yeah, yeah. Honest. <laughs> so where the ball ring is, like the dead centre in the city centre, I am a 10-minute walk away. Um, my shop does not have a sign. I have no signage. You would not know that my shop exists. Right. It's a completely private studio. And when I opened, I kind of had this mindset. That I was like, I don't want to put a sign outside. As I, I am moving into an area already where... I could probably throw my machine out of the window and hit the front door of the other shop. Do you know what I mean? Like it's that close. And I do a subconscious thing in my mind that I was like, I don't want to put a sign there. I don't want to potentially take away from somebody else because all of my work comes online. Uh, you know, and I've kind of proven that it's my third anniversary next month in this shop. And it's incredible because every year it grows, something changes, a new team member comes, and we're looking at expanding the game now. And I've done all of this without having a sign. Yeah, it, you know, there's there is not there's not even a small sign that says tattoo. There is there are no visible markings as to what my studio is, um, and I think that's testament to social media as well. Yeah, you know, to, to being able to do that. But back to my point, yeah, I think subconsciously that was more of a respect thing, whereas I yeah. feel like. Some more modern artists, younger artists as in their careers, uh, career years, um, would have maybe put a big flash in the on sign outside and then could have potentially took food out of the mouths of the other artists in the area. Yeah, down the same street. But I, th and I think that's the thing. I don't think it's done out of malice, but I think it's just done yeah. of, because of this lack of communication. I think I think yeah. if 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 the generations were better at communicating across one another, mm -hmm. that that wouldn't happen as much. Yeah. Because they, they just need to learn this. They don't they're not refusing to learn it. They just don't have the avenue to learn it because they're not creating it and they're not being reached out. Like the I don't know, to put it in a weird way, there needs to be some hands reaching across these generations and like forming more yeah, communication. Because yeah, yeah, no, thinking it's simply gonna happen because people are princes under older generations, that's not gonna happen. It's the same reason yeah. you don't necessarily listen to everything your dad said. Like <laughs> it's not it's not how it happens like you learn stuff yeah. sure but and, and the thing is i think 
and this is going to get me so much hate, but I don't care. I think part of it is that younger people are also waking up to that they don't necessarily want to learn through this abusive relationship that often comes with apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. And what's being lost there, I get why they don't want to do it, but what becomes lost there is also that they don't learn these things from the older generation. But I don't think that's the for the younger generation because I do think it can be done in a better way nowadays, apprenticeships. Oh, 100%. And I think they should remain. But I think this idea of, oh, I got abused, so I now it's my turn to abuse yeah. someone. It's so yeah, fucking yeah, yeah, yeah. dumb. It's but massive. I don't think it's the industry's fault yeah. in total. And I will say this point before we start rounding off because it may explain my point a bit. Saying that, oh, you pay for education, so you should pay for apprenticeships, that that's only true for the UK and the US. First of all, big pet peeve yeah. of mine, you actually get paid to study in Scandinavia. So that's completely ludicrous because then okay. all the two artists yeah. here would pay apprentices automatically. Okay. The other part is in most countries, UK included, I think as well, when you do something that's vocational, you actually get an apprentice salary. But the reason you do this is because it's subsidized because it's a regulated industry. So yes. the government subsidized these payments. Yes. So it's not the in, the tattoo industry's fault that this is not happening. I'm just saying it could happen. It could be oh, a thing where apprentices get paid. Yes, to <laughs> apprentices, and that and the thing is, before anybody says, "Oh, what about the artwork?" Then the thing is, you would get more people going in because they're skilled than than because they can afford to do it. Because mm -hmm. right now, that's the biggest thing that, that makes people apprentices is that if they can afford to have that debt or to live on a rock for a while or to fucking not have any food, proper food for a while yeah. or that shit, you know. Whereas the other thing would be that, hey, like with studies here, you get in if you're skilled enough to do that degree. Yes. You, you, you get into, you become a plumber if you can do plumbing, not yeah. if you can afford the education. You become a hairdresser if you can do hair, not because you can afford the fucking education. Yeah. And that, so you get skilled people. You also get people that just can do it well enough. Of course, of course, that's going to happen. But you also get way more people that find a passion and go, I can do this and I can do it really fucking well. Mm -hmm. Bam. And they're in there. But I do get why it doesn't happen in the industry right now. Because it is not regulated. It's not recognized yeah. by most governments around the world. It's not going to be any subsidies going into it. No. So it's completely dependent on the individual studio or the individual artist that apprentices people if they feel they can afford to pay them or not. And that's how it is right now. And that's not going to change for a while. No. But it could. <laughs> that's my only point. Yeah. And, I, and I know I'm just some fucking sociologist <laughs> saying this, but it's no, fucking no, no, true. No, no, <laughs> no, it's there. You know, I spoke about this recently as well. It's so interesting you said this. It's a big point for me that I've tried to make and tried to get across is I, I'm not saying that they don't deserve to be paid because if you're exchanging labor, you know, um, you can't give up your entire life and dedicate it to something if you're not being paid, of course. Yeah. And not very few people are in the position to do that. But all of the points that you raise, I've spoke about this as well, the talking points, it, it's not a regulated industry. So whereas a plumber's apprentice gets paid, it's because the plumber gets subsidized by the government exactly. to pay the apprentice. And I fully um, get that. <laughs> yeah. And the same, you know, what I think one thing that does get overlooked quite a lot is in UK apprenticeships, at least speaking from my own, I didn't pay for any materials. I didn't pay for my first machine. I didn't pay for my power supply. My mentor paid out of his own pocket and he paid That's great. As, as a trade for you're giving me your time. That's and, you know, I was very fortunate. I had an old school apprenticeship. I soldered needles by hand using a reel of cotton mm. to, to get a tighter, a, a tighter oh, grip on the needles. You know, I was made to do all of that first um, before starting tattooing, even though I've never used a needle that I've soldered myself. You know, it was just <laughs> these things that I was made to do because they're, they're important to learn how yeah. things work um but there were, there were no obligations for me to turn up there were no obligations there was no set amount of days i had to do and i'll try to explain in this as well because i think a big misconception with apprentices in this country is that you're expected to be there constantly yeah and, yeah. Um, and i've tried to say like a few a few people i know like that uh a, I watched them do their apprentice apprenticeships. One artist, he worked a full-time job in a factory over four days. 
So he did a full week worth of work over four days. The rest of the week he spent in the studio. And he did that for two years. That's not healthy, man. That's not healthy. Yeah, 100%. It's not, you know, it's not advisable. But he did that for two years because he knew that even if some weeks he was only in for two days, you know, sometimes, you know, he'd take that day for himself. It wasn't always three days every week. But he knew then, or when he took holiday, he'd be in all the time. You know, take two weeks holiday off work. Uh, And for two weeks, he'd be in the shop because he was still getting paid. But he knew that by doing that, what he was going to get in the end, paid for it. And obviously, as you know, you're right in what you've just said. Uh, There should be resources there. There should be means for them to be paid to not have to do that. But the point I've tried to make to people before is it's not expected, at least it shouldn't be expected, for you to give up your life to do it. If you can give half a day a week, one day a week, two days a week, if you whatever you can dedicate to it, it's more about showing your willingness. Yeah. And then no, you receive. See that that I get with how the things are right now, when it's not possible for like 99 percent of the no, to pay an apprentice. Like it's economically yeah, yeah. unfeasible. I get that. But I do I do like when people are then like you and say, Hey, I get you need to live and have money for food and rent. Mm-hmm. So come in. That's as much as you can in the week. But I get that you need to have a job on the side. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> like, no, that's 100. the reality we live in right now. They, 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 it's a, if you want to only have rich kids thinking they can go in and become tattooers, mm-hmm. then you expect then you can do that because oh, they yeah, all can I mean, live off some trust fund or something and just yeah. pop into the studio all the time. But most people fucking can't that want to be tattooers because it yeah. still is a mostly working class a hundred percent of people that go into this industry you know? yeah i mean i'm from a single parent household on a council estate do you know what i mean like i came from a family a family with nothing and my mom works incredibly hard and she works two to three jobs just to have everything paid and it was always instilled in me to work so i knew that when i decided that i wanted to be a tattoo artist i had to make it work and quick Aye. you know and quick <laughs> I, had, I had to do that and, in a you know, flash. But, <laughs> yeah, I I lived off of off of tips from the other artists. I would I would do everything I could to help them, and they give me twenty pound a week each. If well, I help, yeah. I help them enough. Yeah, but the, but back then, back then in two thousand, that, that was good back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah two thousand seven, sixty pounds a week for a yeah, that's pretty, That's all right. That's pretty decent. Yeah, it paid for my bus, so I got a bus pass. So, you know, in fact, actually, I'm telling a lie. My nan, as a, as a present, my mom disapproved so much that I wanted to be a tattoo artist. <laughs> she disapproved so much. And my nan actually bought me a yearly bus pass. She paid. Oh, that's and, so and, sweet. Yeah, yeah. and she, she gave me this yearly bus pass. And she said, you know, I paid for this. This is for you to be able to learn so that, you know, you could get into the city centre. Mm. Every day I get the bus. Every day, right. you know. And it'd be hard. You know, but my mentor, you know, he'd give me cigarettes. I used to smoke back then and um, help sort me out for lunch. There was a baguette shop around the corner that did one ninety nine. That does sound like a good apprenticeship, to be honest. Like, that, that yeah. does sound like one of the better ones. Yeah, 100%. Like my, 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 point, my, my only main point is because I do understand how it works nowadays with the economically and all that stuff. Yeah. I just don't think you need abuse on top of that. No, of course not. No, no, no. So there's no excuse ever for anybody to receive abuse from a tattoo apprenticeship. That's what I mean. Like, yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, I get, I I even get the menial tasks. I even get, hey, clean up, learn to set up, all that stuff. That I get. But when you hear about people, you know, cleaning toilets with a toothbrush or clean or taking their fucking, uh, fucking mentors Harley Davidson to get serviced and shit like that, it's like fuck off. That has nothing to do with tattooing, man. (laughs) Hi. Yeah. Um, well, you know what they say: hurt people, hurt people. Yeah, so yeah, truly, you know, truly, I kind of feel like there there is a cycle, especially back then. And uh, you've got to look at the people oh, I'm making yes, yes, yes. no excuses, but you've got to look at the people that were tattooing back then uh, as a generalization. You know, we oh, weren't absolutely. talking about artists in the sense now. We're talking about people who, <laughs> for the most part, in my experience anyway, are criminal records. And were involved in the criminal underworld and were tattooing because it was a way to make money without having to adhere to rules for another job. 
We yep. weren't looking at people like today where I want to sit and ask people what their starter is on Pokemon or I want to talk about The Walking Dead for eight hours nonstop, <laughs> you know, um, and, and all of this. You're talking about people that were sniffing lines of Class A in the morning while they were <laughs> And if you got too close to them, you were probably getting bit. Do you know, like, uh, <laughs> it, was, fuck it, it, up. It, it was a different world. It was a different absolutely, world. Absolutely. So you no, have I, I do get and respect that. But but I, yeah. I, I do also think, because I've talked to you about it, Melvin mentioned in his episode as well, and others have mentioned too, yeah. like there are people in your generation of the two of us as well that are going ahead with a good example and being, of course, strict. And of course, they want to teach yeah. people that apprentice under them what they need to know. But they're not being abusive, and that's beautiful yeah. to see. Because I get yeah, that yeah. it's hard, and it is hard to become a two artist. It requires a lot of fucking effort and time. But at least a lot of people nowadays, and I think that's really beautiful to see, like with you, Jason, with Melvin, with Oma, Oba, and many others, they don't abuse people anymore. Yeah, no, no, you can't. It's fucking it's... great because it's abuse enough having to live off a of fucking t- uh, cup noodles for like fucking yeah, yeah. <laughs> four, yeah. four or five years. No. You know? <laughs> Uh, there are there are going to be a, unfortunately the reality is there are going to be a lot of people in this world um that are going to be subject to abuse and the tattoo yeah. industry should not be one of those places where they experience yeah. it no, there's, exactly. there's no there's uh, absolutely yeah. no need for it uh, all, i mean you're all fucking artists anyways like like i spoke with matt lotta about even back in the fucking 20s and 30s it was also art school students that did tattooing and stuff yeah. like that even back then so you've always been a, a really passionate, feely, artsy types, even when it was criminals doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, because think about it. I mean, think about what we're actually doing. It's not, yeah. I don't know. I've always, I kind of feel as well like I know from me growing up, I grew up on a very rough council estate in South Birmingham. Um, uh, you know, like cars burnt out on grass verges, houses being burgled constantly, stabbing, shootings um you know like really horrible horrible things and not a very nice environment to grow up in at all so i feel like me as a teenager getting tattooed was almost camouflage you know i I had my neck tattooed before anybody else my age on my estate and i i got my neck tattooed long before i even got a sleeve which back then was a huge taboo but i knew (laughs) i knew that if i walked my estate at night covered in tattoos, I was less likely to receive Uh, abuse. I was less likely to become a victim to crime. Um, And it's camouflage. And I feel like also a lot of people within the tattoo industry over time have done the same. Yeah. You know, especially when tattoos were feared. I've tattooed, I remember a guy in 2012 that I was tattooing, and he must have been about 60, late 60s, early 70s, and he was covered. A really old school tattoos, but I'm talking all of his face was covered. Uh, and one of the sweetest people I've ever spoken to, he was so soft spoken, he was so friendly, he was so kind. But if you saw him, you would cross the street, especially, you know, back in the 80s and the 70s uh, when he was heavily tattooed. And I realized then you didn't get these tattoos because you are that person. You got these tattoos to give people the idea you're this person, which then protects you. I think that's what's changed as well nowadays, which I love yeah. that nowadays it is more because I, that's for my generation. He's speaking for myself. I did it to like, you know stake my claim. I was heavily bullied and all that stuff. And, yeah, and yeah, yeah. To the rough area as well. And in a different way, I didn't do it to camouflage. I did it to sort of say, hey, you didn't get me. I didn't conform. I didn't change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here, see this, you know. And I think that's a beautiful thing that's changed about it. Like that, 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 it is more like that, you know. And I, and I, for one, don't. As much as it was convenient to guess to get spots in the train to sit on my by myself, yeah. I don't miss when it was feared. Like I know some yeah. people do. I don't personally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'll happily wear that because it's just no, no, an inconvenience most of the fucking time. Yeah, yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. You know, I remember the first time that I went to the United States and yeah. I would I was 20, 20 years old the first time I went. And public opinion then was just completely different how they treat people. Uh, I feel like America, uh, from a social standpoint, you know, is behind Europe, including England, yeah. um, for the most part. 
in my experience anyway. So when I went there and I was experiencing things like I got food in a cracker barrel and I've got 13 tattooed on my neck here, which is quite a normal thing for tattoo artists. And a guy came up to me at the urinal and he thought I was selling marijuana. Um, <laughs> because of M being the 13th letter of the alphabet. And obviously as soon as I started speaking and he heard my accent, I think he kind of realised he was like, oh, no, 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 no. This, this guy's not doing this. <laughs> but that's something you then would have experienced here in the 70s and 80s. Aye, not, in, not in 2009. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like not, not I, still, I still got that back then here in Denmark, but Denmark is a bit when it comes to judging appearance at least, and this is my experience yeah. uh, and, and opinion. When it comes to judging appearance, Denmark is a bit behind the UK. Like we, yeah. we you, you'll find bars and nightclubs still where having tattoos you don't get in. Okay. Like here in Copenhagen, and that's the capital yeah. of Denmark, the most diverse place in the country, and you can find nightclubs in that. And bars where they're like, nope, it's after nine. So suddenly, no to do. <laughs> That's wild. Yeah, it is. It is. And people don't think that because Denmark's quite popular for tattoos as yeah, well. Yeah. You know, and, and, and the there's whole quite a lot of good artists perfect. coming out of here, but that still happens, you know. Yeah. Uh, but but in general, really speaking, it is moving the right way. And in the job environment, it's not really a barrier anymore. I mean, I think here. The job stoppers are still, you know, the traditional free. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but that even that's sort of softening up. Like it's not in the like in the UK, but especially in Scotland, it's like that's no such thing as a job stopper in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can. It, it's it. absolutely yeah, brilliant. Yeah. I loved my first experience having a bank tiller with a neck tattoo. Fucking give me my money. I'm like, fuck yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes, man. <laughs> that, that's <laughs> awesome. But before we get into a whole new podcast episode about professional similar <laughs> tattoos <laughs> i think we need to round up okay and, uh, i think because i always like to end on a lighter note i think i want to ask you what what has been your favorite pokemon tattoo moment because you talked about it a bit here throughout the episode and i think that's a fun way to end to round off before we end then so you say my favorite pokemon tattoo or just my favorite pokemon in general a favorite Pokemon tattoo moment, I would say. Moment. Oh, yeah. So there's, I've got, I've got one client who I'm not even calling him a client anymore. His name is Matt. He's my friend now. We formed a friendship. <laughs> a lot of the pride when you said that. He's my yeah, friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, because I, you know, I tattooed him yesterday. And, um, and yeah, it's just, you know, you meet these people in the industry and they, they stop being clients. They become friends. Oh, you know, yeah. And, and we are actually like, genuinely friends there. Um, but the first tattoo, so we did at my shop last year, a Pokemon Flash Day, just for let's do something fun, you know, let's advertise yeah. them. But there was a rail strike, uh, the weather was horrendous, mm. there were so many things that had happened, and it was a bit of a washout. Like the amount of people that said that they were going to turn up, we all tattooed that day, but not not, not as much not as we really were. Much, yeah. And uh, the guy that I tattooed was Matt. And he had a full color Blastoise, but he had the original artwork uh, from the 1998 base set. And it was just an incredible day because as soon as I started tattooing it on him, he then said that he loved The Walking Dead. I'm a huge Walking Dead fan. I don't shut up about it. So, yeah, that, that's that's a great moment. Like That was a core memory that I built. Uh, in you know, in my career. If I you just got to have things. a full-on geek met a gas yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, client there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just like how how have I met someone that's a similar age to me that likes likes all of the obscure things that I like? It, nice. it was yeah, it was beautiful. It was really nice. I, I do love those moments, man. It's fucking awesome when that happens. Yeah, you know? yeah, I could completely. I mean, that's exactly the same as me with talking with with with, with my old tattoo artist when he did my Star Wars sleeve and just like start talking yeah. about different fucking theories about Sith code and <laughs> Jedi and all that like, stuff. Fucking hell, man. Yeah. And it's amazing stuff, stuff, stuff that would get all other people that aren't deep into Star Wars just look at us like, what the fuck are they on about? <laughs> <laughs> you live, but you you know as a nerd, as a geeky guy as well, you live for those moments sometimes. Like it's fucking amazing when you when you meet someone yeah. and they're like, no, no, we're both fast talking and it's all about <laughs> nerdy shit. <laughs> yeah, like if I get if I get somebody that talks about The Walking Dead at work. Um, that's that's like my go-to. That, that's um, gonna be our main breaking point here, here, Jason, because I hate zombie stuff, man. Like, <laughs> oh, I know. No. Right? 
That's fine. That's fine. I'm not going to let it ruin this. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you. That was a bit awkward by the end of this because of the zombie comment I made. Jason's like, I retract my participation in this podcast. <laughs> No, 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 that's fine. That's fine. Uh, you do seem genuinely slightly upset about that. No, no, no. It's, yeah, it's just, no, so I get this a lot of work because I'll talk about it. And then one of the things that everybody says is season three, um, at the end of season three slash season four, they leave the prison and uh, everybody goes, I stopped watching them. And I'm like, this goes up uh, to season 11. Uh, um, okay. I've got it. Oh, you got it. I didn't even know there was four seasons, mate. There's 11. Oh, there's, fucking there's, hell. There's 11, there's 11 of The Walking Dead. And there's they're doing eight. a spin-off now, too. There's aren't loads. They? No, no, there's loads. There's 11, of, 11 seasons of The Walking Dead. There's eight seasons of Fear the Walking Dead. There are two seasons of Walking Dead World Beyond. There's Daryl oh, Dick, God. which has one season. There's The Ones Who Live, which has one season. And there's Dead City, which has one season. Jason, J- there's, there's loads. way too there's much. Loads. The, the, the closest <laughs> I ever got to be into Walking Dead was buying a Welsh girl I was really into at one point in my young 20s, a comic from The Walking Dead. And that was it. Incredible. Uh, and incredible. I, and I read up a little bit about the author for that, and that yeah. was it, just to get some brownie pots. <laughs> <laughs> incredible. Uh, and my interest in The Walking Dead plummeted exponentially from that moment <laughs> onwards. <laughs> <laughs> but look, we're at the end now, sadly. Uh, and I can, first of all, only say one thing. Thank you so much for coming on. I think it's been a really fun time talking to you. We had some really good deep discussions yeah. of this episode has been quite a laugh and a good time but i also want to say please plug whatever you want to plug right now like of course the studio if you get if you get me the name of that after we 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 hang up so I, you know i could of course tag that uh, up beneath the episode when i uploaded than that but other than yeah. that first of all where can people find you? Uh, so through Instagram and TikTok, uh, my handle on Instagram, I believe, yeah, it's Jason John Miles dot tattoo, and then on TikTok, it's just Jason John Miles. Mm. Awesome. I'll of course I'll link both of those as well. Yeah, yeah. The video. Luckily, when I watch this back, you'll remind me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anything but else no, you want to plug, Jason? Yeah, no, that's about it. I'm just I'm really appreciative of you asking me to come on. Oh, um, I've a had a really nice day today. This sort of talking <laughs> talking with you about all of these issues and yeah it's been really good oh thank you uh, likewise i've really enjoyed this episode and and now we get to start our day with a smile i mean yeah yeah, yeah definitely I, I get to have lunch you get to enjoy the rest of your morning <laughs> yeah <laughs> ah, that's, all, that's all, i'm kidding that's only an hour difference between why my, my, me and jason are so it's, a, it's yeah, not, yeah yeah it's not horrendous yeah, it's not like what i yeah, time difference is the time difference isn't isn't that big between where just we are. Just an hour, yeah. Just an hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But before we get into that, <laughs> to everybody who tuned in to this episode, thank you so much for being here. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Hello everyone, and let me start out this time by apologizing for any confusion I may have caused by the outro for the last episode where I accidentally spoiled who's going to be in, uh, or not spoiled, but uh, advertised who's going to be in episode 28, which is next time. So this time it is for real. Next time we're talking to Katie Misuno about uh, uh, the darker imagery, uh, geometric tattoos, black work tattoos and blackout tattoos and how she sort of has developed her own amazing style within it and shows how much skill and commitment actually goes into these tattoos that some wrongfully deem as overly simplistic at times even blackout tattoos require quite a lot of commitment but <coughs> sorry about that i hope you enjoyed this episode today with uh, jason it's uh, amazing i think to see somebody that doesn't go out trying to just be the loudest guy in the room so to speak uh, on the internet and just yell or angrily argue points they might feel passionate about but instead sits in a setting that he's uh, chosen because it's comfortable and known to a lot of people and there's sort of a tongue-in-cheek joke to it 
uh, with the whole sitting there prepping paper towels and ripping it off. There's also a weird a- ASMR element we didn't really discuss <laughs> to the whole sound of it that some might enjoy. But it's important, I think, to have people that discuss things in that way where it's constructive and uh, well argued without getting angry or throwing blame at people necessarily. And I think we need more of that in the tattoo world, uh, which is also one of the reasons I've done this podcast to try and educate people without necessarily having a discussion and then people can try and take the information and uh, bolster what they already know or maybe try and change their own worldviews and be inspired. But I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I know for a fact you're going to love the next episode with Katie out in a couple of weeks. And thank you very much as always for enjoying the podcast. And I hope you show some support with a like and a follow and a subscription on the relevant pages on Spotify, Instagram and here on YouTube. Thank you very much, everybody.